World Wide Web. I'm Dr. Shadow, the internet personality with the best hair. And um, if you're one of the viewers who's been asking when I'm going to get around to reviewing Scream 5, uh, I'm sorry? This one just really caught my eye. Got recommended on my Amazon Prime as more movies they'll think I'll love. And well, I guess we're going to find out about that with this week's review of Sharks of the Corn. Stephen Kang, Sharks of the Corn. Who is Stephen Kang, you ask? No idea. Nobody who had anything to do with this movie was even remotely named Stephen Kang. The only Google result I got for Stephen Kang was a cardiologist, and I'm pretty sure he has nothing to do with this movie. This is simply one of those ultra-low-budget flicks out of SRS cinema. Stephen Kang's Sharks of the Corn asks the question, what if we took a well-known Stephen King story and changed the title just enough to turn it into a cheesy shark movie? And that answer is, uh, there are cornfields. Full of sharks. That's about it for the basic plot synopsis. But if you want to get deeper into it, it's actually surprisingly convoluted. But uh, anyway, let's take a look at Sharks of the Corn and see if this one's got some real bite or if the whole thing is just too corny. Ah, that one hurt my soul. And the movie opens up in a cornfield where sharks are about. Well, we got that one out of the way real fast. And now to establish it's a horror movie. Oh, geez, I thought for a second that the video glitched out. Also, fun fact, you can easily tell whenever this movie changes over to stock footage because when it does, it looks far better than the actual film. Once we're back to the real movie, we are introduced to two barely important characters. Gary, played by Jason Boyd, and Susan, played by Rebecca Reinhardt. He's the winner of the Corn Fest Corn Eating Contest, and she's somehow impressed by that, and is interested in all things corn, especially the weird stories around the cornfields, like the one that Gary's far, far more famous brother has been posting. Have you seen his YouTube channel? He's got, he's got video of Bigfoot. Oh god, don't tell me you actually believe anything on Huff Paranormal. Gary is far more interested in getting wasted, though, but not before Susan can tempt him for a naked cornfield rump. So she heads into the field, leaving him a trail of garments to follow. But before long... What in the hell? Is that a corn cob? Or are you just happy to see me? There's a scarecrow with a shark head! Which will make sense later. Oh, who am I kidding? No, it won't. No reason to slow down. She continues to disrobe, and Gary continues to follow. Up until he finds the scarecrow, then he decides to just sit down right on top of the corncob cock and take a nap. Meaning he misses the best part. No, not Susan going topless. But the shark in the cornfield chasing her down and killing her! which roars like a dinosaur out of an asylum movie. For some reason. That's great, but it's time to completely change set and introduce a new character. Teddy Bear, Teddy Bo Lucas, played by Steve Gein. He's a fucking psychopath, much like the editor of this movie, cutting back and forth between Teddy and various shots of sharks, more murder, or sharks doing murder, all the while Teddy dresses up in the most intimidating yet somehow pathetic garb he can muster. And it all involves Stonehenge, somehow. Why? Because it happened to be part of the stock footage bundle they purchased. Like this motel sign signifying where Teddy is staying, and where he finds a handy-dandy prostitute, played by Shannon Stockin. She doesn't seem to mind his crazy eyes or shark mask. He minds that he's got money, and that's good enough for her. But upon entering his hotel room, she sees the shark altar he's got all set up, and Teddy takes the opportunity to launch into a lore dump about sharks. How they're perfectly evolved and effectively gods of the sea! Nobody knows the power of the great white, <laughs> but they're about to find out. Nobody knows how to frame a shot either from the looks of it. Eyelines, people! Use them! Somehow impressed by his nerding out over marine biology, she has no warning whatsoever when he takes the jaws of a shark and uses them to murder the fuck out of her! Because of a uh, upcoming war 
something. He keeps rambling and sharks keep getting superimposed over the ramps. Anyway, one stock footage moon later, which I guess they wanted smaller, but just uh, scaled down without accounting for exactly where the film cuts off. And under the cover of day for night, he buries the remains in a cornfield. Oh yeah, the cornfield where sharks are currently killing people. That resulted in a dead body earlier, which greatly upsets the uh, um, authority figure guy, uh, Kramer, played by Al Nicolosi. Sure, Gary had no motive and was passed out drunk, but still, he's the only one who was here and therefore the prime suspect. I mean, it could have been a wild animal. I mean, it could have been a Bigfoot. Bigfoot? Aliens? You and your brother Jonathan would like that, wouldn't you? Whoa, when did aliens come up? Don't get wacky now. We're dealing with sharks swing around cornfields, psycho serial killers, and uh, Stonehenge for some reason. But Kramer thinks that alien Bigfoot's murdering local women would be just the publicity Gary's brother needs to prop up the value of his real estate ventures. I guess that makes sense to someone out there. So Gary is under arrest. More importantly... Should we close the cornfield? No, no, I don't think we should be closing the cornfield. It's harvest season. People gotta pay their bills. Despite all logic and reason, we gotta shoehorn the plot of Jaws into this movie somehow so they will not shut down this private land. If you're expecting this to make any more sense going forward, well, uh, I don't know how to put this, but we suddenly see two ski masked bedecked burglars sneaking around in the woods and taking out shark cultists. But wait, there are deadly traps they must avoid. Now yeah, that foil wrap paper mache stings. Getting past the final shark cultist guards, they find alien bones and what they came for, a shark pup in a jar. You know it's important because Stonehenge stock footage doesn't just pop up for nothing, right? Stealing the pup, the alarm is triggered, so they must run. The cultists spot them, but then... Huh. You know, all things considered, that CGI explosion actually didn't look half bad. So let's follow it up with some of the worst attempts at special effects ever seen in a movie. The burglarizers meet up with their benefactor, Benchley, played by Casey Miracle. He promised cash for pups, and upon receiving his prize... Ugh. Ugh, he uses a straw to shoot invisible darts that sound electrical, and drop the two of them. God, I miss the high production values we got out of the asylum. This was him tying up loose ends. Even though in this scene they're clearly alive, but later he talks like they're dead, so just pick whatever works at the time. Point is, we suddenly change over to Day for Night, where a woman walks alone in a cornfield. Though perhaps not entirely alone. <laughs> there is a Bigfoot in the cornfield! And evidently this was all just one big misunderstanding. As this is a realty commercial! On the plus side, that gives us a little time to admire the far, far higher quality stock footage, at least for a few seconds, before we're thrust back into the movie, introduced to Police Chief Schneider, played by Shannon Stockin. It's a boring, eventless day on patrol, at least until Teddy Bo Lucas drives past, looking suspiciously suspicious. So she pulls him over and before long, realizes there are pieces of dead body in the back seat of his car. And the fact that it's all presented like crime scene photographs lets her know that he's not just taking his spirit Halloween props out for a drive. So she demands he get out of the vehicle at once! And, uh, I guess the editor must have thought that the photography effect was really cool because they won't stop doing it. Seriously, this arrest goes on for two minutes and it just keeps happening! You have the right to remain safe. Why don't you sit on my face, you fucking pig? Anything you say or do can be used against you in a court. Honestly? I actually like the explosion, and I could go for another one about now. Anyway, 
Anyway, here's where 90% of the movie budget went. They bought a drone. This is being used by Gary's brother, Jonathan, played by Ford Windstar, to observe his cornfields. But what's this? There appear to be sharks swimming around within the cornfields. More importantly, though, his brother calls him up like, John, how's things? Could you come pick me up? I'm currently in jail for murder. So as he goes, we jump back over to Benchley as he meets up with the Mafia. I wish I could say I'm glad to see you. Always a pleasure, Jeffrey. Played by... God knows who. I don't see a single person listed anywhere as playing Jeffrey, so... Uh... What the hell do I do now? Uh, the call to action! Remember to like the video, and subscribe if you haven't, and you can comment too. Comment down below, uh, comments if you know who the hell played Jeffrey. Anyway, the tall, pendulette looking motherfucker is the leader of the Mafia, surrounded by subordinates, such as Biff, played by Zoe Bush, the obvious child, Joey, played by Amanda Healy, wearing a Beetlejuice suit, like the only thing Party City had in their size, and Angel, played by Billy W. Blackwell. Mafia Jeff wants to buy the shark pup off of Benchley, but Benchley needed some insurance just to keep himself from ending up like his own former employees. He's not selling the pup, but a map to the pup. Thus, little boy and scrawny man seek it out. Where is it? Why, in the middle of a cornfield, of course. But when they acquire the shark pup, we get Stonehenge stock footage as they are suddenly attacked! <laughs> Like most horror movie monsters, the corn sharks are only really unavoidable death when the plot says so. Somehow, Mafia Jeff and Angel realize that the two are dead instantaneously, so they move to kill Benchley! Slowly. Incredibly slowly. Both by action and the editing, giving him plenty of time to dodge these two mile per hour bullets. Angel goes to find the pup, but before he can, Benchley makes it to the cornfield, retrieving the pup and getting out well before the sharks have a chance to get him. This pisses off Mafia Jeff to no end, but it's not the end of the world. I planned ahead, I planted a GPS tracking device in that money bag. So they know exactly where he is, and therefore, we just kind of exist as a background threat for the time being. As a far more active character would be our serial killer, Teddy Bo Lucas, over here. Shatter has brought him to her undercover interrogation room that is super maximum security, but just to throw Teddy off, has the appearance of a cheap one-bedroom apartment. Here, she interrogates him, and he freely admits, Oh yeah, murder? Sure, done a ton of that. All in the hopes of resurrecting our shark goddess, Chichimatol, who is empowered by the sacrifices delivered to the cornfield. Something, something, Stonehenge! Power! Magic. I could take you there, though. Show you. Yeah, we really need to change the scenery for this movie. How about... I don't know. A cornfield! So she intends to have him lead her to the cornfield. But first, Benchley is running off with that money, but oh darn it, car won't start. So he's on foot for now. This takes so long that Jonathan has finally made it, responding to his brother's call. Only issue is that Kramer here not only hates prime suspect Gary, but he especially hates Jonathan. His real estate shenanigans are so outlandish. After Gary, Jonathan is prime suspect number two in the murder of Susan. Me? Are you out of your mind? I was in Lexington. Well, you know what they say, something, something, Stonehenge, Bigfoot, aliens, throw him in the cell! On the topic of absolutely bullshit stories with no logic or reason, Jonathan shows Kramer the shocking truth that there are sharks in the cornfields. But just because he's got video proof of sharks in the cornfields, that doesn't mean that Kramer actually believes there are sharks in the cornfields. Besides, this is the best harvest in years. They can't close the fields. Yada yada, you've seen Josie, you know the deal. On a totally unrelated note with the cornfields open, a happy family just so happens to be playing frisbee near a cornfield. But whoopsie, dad threw the frisbee a bit far into the cornfield and the youngin runs in to get it. But then... Shark! <laughs> <laughs> Frisbee goes in the corn. You go in the corn. Sharks in the corn. Why? Because Stonehenge! This turn of events is finally enough to get Mayor Zanuck, played by Tard Martin, to say they must close down the cornfields! But Mr. Mayor, you listen to me, you dumb dick, for the first time in your life. This is an election year. We gotta at least make some kind of a half-ass effort to act like we care. Ah, politician joke. So they split up into two groups to hunt the shark. 
You'd think they'd need a bigger truck, but we're not going to be nearly that smart about this. First, though, who should Chief Scheider just so happen to run into on the way to the field but Benchley? She offers him a ride, and they ride that way together. Speaking of together, Kramer and company head into the cornfields and are henceforth never going to come up in the movie again. That out of the way, Benchley lays out a shocking revelation. He is actually a CIA agent who has been working on this shark cult case for years. The Mafia were never the bad guys, just trying to prevent shark again in their own way. But this cult is planning something big soon. Do you want to go on into the eye of the storm? Fucking hey. Well, let's go. That's no reason to prevent the big epic final confrontation from happening. That'd be a hell of an anticlimactic way to end the movie. Anyway, back to the fields. Jonathan got a little harpoon gun he just so happened to have in his truck, but he's not completely prepared. That is, until a delivery man pops out of the cornfield to give him a package he ordered four hours ago. Then it's back to the cornfield to get killed by a shark. But what did he bring? There are shark repellent bracelets, like off, but for sharks. Well, at least that does explain how the delivery guy got through the cornfield unscathed. The first time. I ain't gonna wear one of those things, you put. But the mayor refuses to wear one because... He's an idiot. Thus, they head in. Right around the same time that Scheider and Benchley manage to arrive. They don't know what kind of risks Teddy Bo Lucas is bringing them into, but not to worry, for Scheider has some spare weapons the police confiscated earlier, and Benchley's free to help himself. Things are about to get real. Brought <laughs> this, Scheider knocks Benchley out, as it is time for the big twist. So, 50-50 chance, what could it be? Well, Scheider isn't working for the Mafia. She has, in fact, been a secret shark cultist all along! But why? All my life, have been nothing to anybody. I've always been nothing but a fucking failure! And yeah, all she's managed to do in all this time is become chief of police. I mean, without the shark cult, she's like nothing. Now it's time to explain everything. All these murders were to power up the shark goddess for her resurrection, turning the chosen shark cultists into half-shark monsters. Why the cornfield? Why, it's a handy-dandy ancient burial ground, and there's just one more ingredient they needed to complete the resurrection ritual. This is the 13th pup. The 13th pup from Chi-Chi Metal! Yeah, I guess there were just 12 more of them that they just didn't bother bringing up until now. And no, your eyes do not deceive you. That's definitely a different one than they've been howling around all movie. So they intend to finish the ritual and have Shida reborn as the great white shark goddess. But in the cornfields, Mayor Zanuck is attacked and Jonathan runs for his life before knocking himself out on the softest boulder known to man. But remember, he has that shark repellent bracelet on, so he's fine. But being knocked out, it gives the baddies plenty of time to work on that ritual and for the rest of the cast to arrive. Benchley has come too and oh yeah, the Mafia has been chasing him via helicopter this entire time. That is, until... They are taken out of this movie as well! Well, they did a lot. I mean, they could have just not been in the movie and it would have gone just the same. And just, you know, have Benchley get the pup from the burglar bros, betray them, go for a walk, get picked up, end up in the cornfield. Why did he try and sell the pup to the mafia and then get the pup back that... Wait, he was a CIA agent, right? He was trying to get that pup in the first place, so... Why was he trying to sell it to the Mafia guys. Like, he was trying to successfully do that. Things went kind of tits up on that deal. If he had, he would have been... What? It makes less sense! Anyway, Jonathan has come to and ran like hell out of the cornfield, right into Benchley. Benchley explains the shark cult is planning evil magic that must be done by the moonlight. So he says they should wait until the cover of night to move. So, it's nighttime in the UK, making it nighttime in the cornfield as well. Kinda, it's a mix of shots at night and shots in day for night, just because. With a combination of overacting, black magic, and stock footage, Teddy Bo Lucas resurrects the shark goddess, and he himself becomes a sharkman to serve by her side. So this is what happens? Don't blame me, I didn't write it. So the spell is complete. The sharks won. All because the good guys continue to just sit on their asses. Okay, I guess we better do something besides watch this like it's a bad movie. Being self-aware about that doesn't make it any better. 
But what's this? It's Bigfoot from the rear with a boulder smashing Teddy Bo's Sharkus, giving Jonathan the chance to harpoon him before Benchley drops a grenade in the shark goddess's crown, blowing her head the fuck up. Therefore, happy ending. The good guys won. And we get to spend a strangely long amount of time watching them just uh, get in the car to leave. Oh, but the shark cult is still kicking. <laughs> Wonderful. I would just love a sequel to this. Um, anyway, that, that was Sharks of the Corn. God, that was awful. On the one hand, what do you expect out of a Tim Ritter movie? On the other, you know me, and no, I love some low-budget cheese, but oh man, this was a painful one. Between the ultra-low-quality video and audio, the barely-there acting, the jumbled editing, it's one of those movies where the biggest question it leaves the audience with was, did that even count as a movie? And to that end, yeah, technically, there is a plot, albeit derivative and all over the place, the script seemingly trying to make the most batshit shark movie out there. Honestly, that is a tough thing to aspire to do. The best thing I can say about the acting, though, is that Steve Gein actually shined as the one semi-decent performance in this movie. He was flaky when his character was meant to be flaky, overly casual when it was called for, and he even put his all into batshit insane when the time came. Most actors seem to be doing their best to simply remember their lines. He actually did act. But that's about the best thing I can say about anything in this movie. The effects were cheap, where most shark attacks were obvious hand puppets. The cinematography was woefully amateurish, with next to no regard for framing. And the quality of the visuals were so ass that the stock footage looked phenomenal in comparison. So, no, I do not recommend Sharks of the Corn. If you're interested in a bad movie to laugh at with friends, there are plenty more options out there that won't have quite so much downtime. Regrettably, even as a fan of bad movies, Sharks of the Corn is a slow, unengaging hodgepodge of scenes contrasted with an absolutely bonkers plot that is pretty hard to make any sense of at all. Coming in at one stock footage overlay out of five. And finally, Amazon, what the hell was that? You said movies we think you'll love. It certainly caught my eye, but I did not love that one. Thank you all for watching. I have been Decker Shadow. And remember, like corn, movies are only better when you add explosions. Have a grenade, bitch! Oh, great, now I'm gonna get a whole bunch of other comments asking me when I'm gonna review the Jaws series next. But you know what other shark movie I reviewed that's incredibly low budget and distributed by SRS Cinema? Oh, that would be bad CGI sharks over here. Now don't let the name throw you off. This is, it has, I mean, it, uh, well, I liked it a lot better. And there's always what YouTube recommends, but if it's anything like what Amazon recommends, I would highly suggest that one.